This is Dr. Jeffrey Niehaus in his teaching on biblical theology. This is session number eight, The Davidic Covenant. Now, as we recall, when we talked about the Abrahamic Covenant, uh, that covenant embodied in itself entailed uh, the um, foreshadowing, shall we say, of uh, three different covenants. That is to say, the whole special grace program. The Mosaic Covenant, uh, the Davidic Covenant implied in kingship in Genesis 17 when the Lord said that kings would come forth from Abram and Sarah. And the New Covenant, uh, implied uh, by both the embodiment of the, or the inclusion of the Genesis 12 promise that uh, in Abram's seed, all the families of the earth would be blessed, repeated in Genesis 22, and by the Lord's passage between the pieces in Genesis 15, symbolically uh, foreshadowing the cross where the Lord would take on himself the punishment for the seed of Abraham. Um, and so, specifically then, the Davidic covenant uh, anticipated in the Abrahamic. And important to uh, understand that the Davidic covenant, uh, as we said, um, David also is a covenant mediator prophet, but a mediator of a very unusual covenant in that it's focused on the royal line. That's all it has to do with. Um, David himself was still under the Mosaic Covenant. Indeed, it would become a problem for Israel later, and Jeremiah, for instance, in uh, Jeremiah uh, 17, what is sometimes referred to as the Temple Sermon, uh, Jeremiah has to say, or the Lord says through him, don't be misled by deceptive words, namely the Temple of the Lord, the Temple of the Lord, the Temple of the Lord. Because when the Lord made that covenant with David, he promised that David's offspring would build a temple, which Solomon did. But the people misunderstood this to think that, well, now we've got the temple, we're all set. The Lord's never going to leave his house, uh, and so Jerusalem can never be conquered. And indeed, when Sennacherib invaded Judah and conquered everything but Jerusalem, it looked as though that was going to be the way of it. So Jeremiah has to tell them in that chapter... You can't go on committing all these sins and then come and think you're forgiven and then go out and do them again just because you got the temple. What they didn't understand was that the Mosaic Covenant trumped the, the Davidic Covenant, shall we say. It was the governing covenant, and the kings themselves had to be obedient to it. Uh, so, but the, nonetheless, so David did mediate a covenant, but it was a narrowly focused covenant on the royal line. Well... It's anticipated, as we said, by the promise of kings in Genesis 17. We know that David was a prophet, just not to think even yet of being a covenant mediator prophet, but we know he was a prophet uh, because in, uh, we have here <coughs> in uh, the, what happens with Samuel anointing him. He takes the, oil of, the horn of oil and anoints him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And the Lord spoke through David. Um, incidentally, it's an interesting statement here. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, came to David, uh, is the Hebrew, actually. But uh, the point is this. Sometimes people will think, well, before Pentecost, maybe there were some people under the Old Covenant who actually had the Holy Spirit, as we do. And I suppose if you wanted to point to someone you thought might be a good candidate for that, David would certainly be the one. Uh, but we're told here that the Spirit would come to him. And so you're never told that the Spirit dwelt in him. And you're never told that the Spirit dwelt in anyone uh, under the Old Covenant. No one's called a temple under the Old Covenant for that reason. Um, and so, but it's a, great, it's a great thing to have the Holy Spirit come to you every day. That's not a bad thing at all. He's with you. Uh, he guides you. He gives you wisdom and so on. The Spirit did speak through David. great example of that is what's sometimes called the last words of David. After, after all, what we read in the scripture here, these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, son of Jesse. The oracle of the man exalted by the Most High. Man anointed by the God of Jacob, Israel's singer of songs. 
He says, the spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. So David was certainly a prophet. Uh, and indeed, the spirit speaking through him, being the same as his, the Lord's word being on David's tongue, points to a New Testament reality that Jesus makes very clear. Jesus says, the words I speak to you are spirit. So the words a prophet speaks or writes are actually the Holy Spirit taking the form of words, giving us words. While the New Testament calls David a prophet, Peter here at Pentecost um, explaining uh, what's going on. He says, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here this day. But he was a prophet and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay, alluding to Psalm 16. And so Peter just explaining that what they're seeing at Pentecost is because of what the Christ has done. Well, as a prophet, and we talked about how there's warfare waged and then a covenant made, we see that pattern with the Davidic covenant too. David has these various campaigns, and then in 2 Samuel 7, after them, uh, we read, okay, the Lord is settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from his enemies all around him. That sets the stage for what follows. And this is an interesting passage in terms of what a prophet might or might not hear. We understand that David's a prophet. Uh, Nathan also is a prophet. Um, and so David is saying to Nathan after this military, this series of military successes, he says, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. Now, that might seem a little vague to a modern reader, but I think it's even clear enough to a modern reader. But in the ancient Near Eastern context, it's very obvious. In the ancient world, if a king, and the, the pagan annals are full of this sort of thing. They go out, they have war, they have victories, they come back home. They're going to do one thing, one of these things. They're going to at least dedicate some of the spoils of war to the god they thought gave them the victory. Or, if the god's temple needs to be refurbished, they'll do that. Or, if it seems a new temple to the god is in order, they'll build a new temple. So when David says this, he's making this oblique statement, but it's really saying, look, here I am in a palace of cedar. The Lord's in a tent. Let's build him a palace of cedar. And in fact, the word for palace in Hebrew and palace and uh, temple are the same. Uh, Hekal is the word. It's really a loan word. It's a transliteration that goes back to Sumerian. It means big house. And that's why it can be a palace or a temple, because the king has a big house, a palace. The Lord has a big, he's a God, he has a big house, a temple. Another word that's used for both is simply the word for house. And that's the word that occurs in this passage. So David is saying a house. Um, and so Nathan, Nathan this, this is what I love about it, because Nathan's a prophet. And so what is his answer to David? David Nathan at this point answers out of what he understands from the world that he lives in. The, king, the God has given our king a victory. Of course, we build a temple for the God. So he is speaking out of his cultural expectations. So he says, sure, go ahead and do it. Whatever you got in mind. But then what? Well, the Lord speaks to Nathan that night and says, no, no, that's not what's going to happen. That's not what I have in mind at all. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I've not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. Interestingly, this is the same thing that Amos says later in the northern kingdom. He says, the Lord took me from following the flock and brought me up here to prophesy. It's a statement clearly of the Lord's sovereign election of someone to an office. So the Lord, he says, I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people. 
I've been with you wherever you've gone. I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now, I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since I, the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. And then the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. <clears throat> okay, well, a couple of things here. And first of all, again, the, the, the interesting thing about this is Nathan is a prophet. And so Nathan's first response as a prophet, as a man to David is, well, go and do whatever you have in mind, the Lord's with you. But at that point, he's just speaking as a man out of his own cultural expectations. Later, the Lord shows up and tells him, no, I have something different in mind. So the fact that he's a prophet doesn't mean that every word he says is from the Lord. He just expressed his thoughts as a man. The Lord had something different in mind. And what the different thing is that the Lord is going to build David's house. And so there's a play on the word house here because David wants to build the Lord's house, meaning temple, the Lord says, I'm going to establish your house, your household, your dynasty. Um, and uh, however, your offspring will build a house for my name, the name meaning the essential nature, the essential character, the being of the God, uh, of the Lord in this case. And that's, that was the understanding. So incidentally, when you read in John 14, 26, until now, John 16, 24, excuse me, until now you've not asked for anything in my name, Ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. Well, what's the meaning of that? It's, uh, I think we understand, it's not, well, uh, may uh, a, Maserati, a Maserati with the, the title and the keys show up in my driveway tomorrow morning in Jesus' name. It's not some kind of magic formula. It's if we're asking according to his nature, then he's going to do it. And our joy will be complete because we're on the same page with him. We get the joy of being, asking for what he wants to do. We get to be part of that. But anyway, the Lord is going to have this house built, but it'll be uh, David's offspring, who we know is Solomon, who's going to do it. I will be his father. He'll be my son. We understand that's an adoptive sonship. The Lord is not saying that David, your son is going to be, your offspring is going to be uh, born from above, a supernatural birth. Um, and he does promise that, you know, even if he sins, my love uh, and the Hebrew word there is chesed, which I would rather translate as grace, but will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul. That's a pretty heavy statement because that word that's translated love is really part of a covenant word pair in Hebrew, love and truth or grace and truth as I would translate it. And that shows up in John 1 too. The law came through Moses. In Jesus we have grace and truth. I'd say in Jesus we have the, cut, the guts of the covenant, what it's really all about. <clears throat> the covenant relationship. And so, uh, so that, that's a pretty heavy statement about Saul. But uh, the Lord is saying he may sin, but I'm not going to take that away from him. And then there's this promise, your house and kingdom will endure forever and your throne will be established forever. That's where Israel went wrong because they thought, well, that's it. We're guaranteed. You know, doesn't, the Lord has painted himself into a corner here. It doesn't matter how badly we sin. The, Jerusalem will never fall. Zion will never fall. And of course, the thing is that this has a supernatural, a super terrestrial reality because the son of David, namely Jesus, always was king over Israel and always is. And that throne it does endure forever uh, and his kingdom endures forever. But that's not the earthly throne or kingdom that people naturally probably had in mind when they heard this. Well, that... Although the word covenant doesn't appear here, this is understood to be the making of the uh, Davidic covenant. 
Psalm 2 later reflects this, um, and I've tried to outline the corresponding parts here. So both of these, you know, in 2 Samuel 7, you have security from the foes that is talked about, uh, and uh, the Lord establishes his throne. The Lord is going to be like the Father. The King is going to be like his Son. It's an adoptive sonship. Uh, and there's the chastening. You know, I will punish him with the rod of men, but I will not take my grace away from him. Psalm 2, some people think, and I think this is a likely thing, that Psalm 2 had to do with the occasion of Solomon's accession to the throne. And so these things come into play. And so when in verse 7 we hear, or we read, you are my son, this day I have begotten you, um, the understanding is, well, this is an adoptive sonship, uh, and that's fine. But later, this is picked up in the New Testament, in Hebrews 1, as part of the discussion that um, uh, the son is superior to angels. To which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, this day I have begotten you? And of course, in the case of Jesus, that's a genuine, real beginning, uh, the virgin birth, as we know. The chastening is mentioned here. It's not mentioned in Psalm 2. I think probably the reason for that, if we understand that as a poem about Solomon's coming to the throne, is that Solomon's accession to the throne would be a festive occasion. And you're probably not going to say, oh, and by the way, if you flub up, this is what's going to happen, right? So that's probably why that that kind of note is not sounded there. But anyway, there you have it. This, of course, is what Gunkel would have called a royal, uh, did call a royal psalm, having to do with a contemporary king in Israel. And that's fine as far as it goes. What he wouldn't acknowledge is that the use of it later in the New Testament was actually because it did foreshadow the Christ, um, which is something we understand was the case. Well, it wouldn't do any harm to think a little bit about the covenant and the covenant idiom here, covenant cutting idiom, because as we said, the term covenant doesn't even show up in this passage, although it's universally recognized as enshrining the Davidic covenant. And incidentally, one thing that's true about 2 Samuel 7, as is true about all the other reports of the divine human covenant making in the Old Testament, they are narratives that contain the components of a covenant or a treaty, whereby we understand that a covenant is being made. Uh, like Genesis 1, you have a covenant being made in 2 Samuel 7, and the term covenant doesn't show up. Unlike Genesis 1, you do later have reference to a covenant making with regard to David. Um, and so, just some examples here, 2 Chronicles 7, I will establish your royal throne as I literally cut with or cut for David, your father, when I said, you shall never have to fail to have a man rule over Israel. Um, and uh, let's drop down to a few others here. David, took, because using the idiom, cut for, 2 Chronicles 21. Nevertheless, because of the covenant the Lord had made with or cut for David. So here you have the term covenant and cut. Uh, the, the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David. He had promised to maintain a lamp for him uh, and his descendants forever. And I'll talk about that note, not lamp, but yoke in just a moment. But it's worth noting here that the term cut a covenant, which from Genesis 15 we know has to do with the literal cutting of animals and passing between them. The term is used for the Davidic covenant but there's no, nothing in the history at all that tells us that David, that there ever was such a ritual in the case of the Davidic covenant. So it would seem that later then, with regard to the Davidic covenant, you could use the term to cut a covenant without actually having the cutting of the animals. But still, you know, this is a, this is a divine covenant. The Lord's giving the covenant. He's doing it. What about the lamp and yoke? Well, the word for lamp in Hebrew is near. And... Uh, N-I-R, you could spell it. Um, and uh, that looks like that's the word for lamp. And so this has been translated lamp, typically. Uh, some years ago, a scholar wrote an article pointing out that there's an Assyrian word, niru, which means yoke. And uh, argued that what's been going on here is not lamp, but yoke. And actually, that makes very good sense, because the term niru, or yoke, 
was used all the time for the yoke of suzerainty, the yoke of kingship. The Assyrians would boast, I impose the heavy yoke of my suzerainty upon some vassal. Um, and so probably the near here is not that he promised to maintain a lamp for him, but a yoke for him. In other words, he promised to maintain kingship for him and his descendants. That idea, incidentally, and the, the concept of yoke was used in Jesus' day too. The Romans used the, their term yugum, which is yoke, for the same sort of thing. And so it's kind of interesting when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble of heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. If we think of that against the Assyrian background, I impose the heavy yoke of my suzerainty upon the vassal. I think there may be a connection there, and just in the tradition. Uh, just as Jesus says, you know, the pagans, they lord it over people. Um, so Jesus is saying, you know what, take my yoke upon you. That's a good thing for you to do. I am your suzerain, but my yoke is easy. Uh, it's not a heavy burden. Um, and there's all this stuff about Jesus being our yoke fellow, you know, with like two oxen going along. There may be something to that. The, the term, it can be used more than one way at the same moment. But I think there's plenty of background here for understanding the suzerainty with regard to the yoke. Um, other examples here. Um, and so I don't need to read through all of them. You have them here. Um, and... Uh, but the point is, to sum this up, covenant without a literal cutting. So clearly in later usage here, to cut a covenant did not necessarily mean an oath passage or a sacrifice, but it always had the sense of ratifying or bringing into existence something as a legal arrangement. And uh, we recall that the Noahic covenant is another one that was identified as such without a cutting ceremony. Okay, so the part of the deal with the Davidic covenant is there's going to be this house for the Lord's name. There's going to be this temple presence. It's going to be by David's offspring. Uh, that's what's promised in the covenant and in the covenant narrative. And that's what we see fulfilled in 1 Kings when Solomon builds the temple. <coughs> so, when, if we relate this at this point to the major paradigm, uh, we can do that. There will be some, vari some variations, as we'll note. But God works by his spirit through the word, a prophet figure. And uh, it's clear enough from the Old Testament data that David was a prophet. But in Acts 2, Peter labels him as such, identifies him as such. He works through that prophet figure, David, to war against and defeat his foes, as we've noted. Uh, he then establishes a covenant. It's in brackets because it's not with the people, but it's with David himself and then the royal line. And likewise, with regard to establishing that people as God's people, it's establishing David as his king with his successors. And then the establishing a temple among his people. Again, it's establishing the temple, but because of the work of the king, the king's offspring, and then he's going to reside among them. So just important to understand, though, the variations. He's not establishing, God is not establishing Israel as his people here. He's already done that in the Mosaic Covenant. He does assure them of peace, though. Um, and uh, the Davidic kingship has something to do with this. It's going to bring some benefits to the people. Um, and uh, that's what we've already read. He does establish the Davidic line as royal. Um, and uh, that's as we have read about. So this is the focus of it. He's focusing on David and the royal line. And one of the, one of the things he's going to be doing as part of this too is to magnify David's name. Uh, we note ironically Genesis 11 where the builders of the Tower of Babel said, let's build ourselves a city so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the earth. Well, make a name for yourself, what does that mean? That means you're pretty significant, and people would probably not come and take you on. Uh, and so you wouldn't be defeated and scattered. Um, but it's quite a difference, making a name for yourself and having the Lord make a name for you. 
Um, and uh, this is Old Testament material, but it certainly has modern application. If you or I hope to have a great name, which I would kind of question the desire for that in the first place, but if you wanted that, it's gonna, it better be the Lord who does it. Because if you or I try to do it, it's not very healthy. It's not spiritually healthy at all. Uh, it's in the direction of wanting to be like God. I want to make a name for myself. No, let the Lord make your name, whatever he wants it to be. If you're a pastor of a megachurch, if you're a pastor of a 50-member church in Vermont or something, whatever it may be, um, let the Lord be doing it. And, of course, the Lord is promising the son as the royal heir, and we've talked about that. Isaiah 9.5 is, of course, the passage that really articulates that, that uh, this child who's going to be born is going to be called the mighty God, the everlasting uh, Father, the Prince of Peace. Um, and if we look at Jesus saying, he who sees me sees the Father, we see the realization of that. Um, this uh, Davidic son promise ultimately being realized in Christ, uh, after that naming in Isaiah 9.5 about this one who's going to be incarnate, you know, he, his name will be, this child will be born and his name will be the mighty God. Uh, we read of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, uh, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Um, and so we're looking now at this Davidic king as we see him mentioned here and there in the prophets. And there's certainly a lot of that in Isaiah. In love a throne will be established, in faithfulness a man will sit on it, one from the house of David, and so on. Um, in Isaiah 22:22, 22, 22, interestingly, in the house of David, a servant in the house of David, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who will replace Shebna as the steward of the palace because he made a costly grave for himself and shored up Jerusalem's defenses and was part of revelry in the face of coming judgment. He's, he's heard from Jeremiah the Babylonians are coming, or rather from Isaiah, <laughs> the, Babylonians, the, the, uh, the Assyrians are coming. He's heard there's judgment coming, and so, but he's still done all this in the face of all that. So the Lord brings a judgment on him. And uh, he's placing on Eliakim the key, the, the, the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. That just finds a fascinating analog, I think, in Matthew 16, when Jesus says to Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So here's Jesus of the household of David giving words to a servant of the household of David, just as here, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So a little bit of uh, typology even within the, uh, the, under the Christology of David and uh, Jesus. This passage, incidentally, just so we understand, um, it's been badly misunderstood. And I don't even know why it gets translated this way. Because what it says in the Greek is, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So Jesus here is not saying, Peter, I'm giving you this commission, this authority. Whatever you say, we'll back you up. He's saying, whatever you say is something that will already have been decided in heaven. So he's saying, I'm giving you this privilege of prophetic statement and utterance. Um, so this is not up to Peter. He's simply the servant who is reporting, in effect, putting into effect, what has been bound or loosed in heaven already. Well, Isaiah 55, a very famous passage too. Give ear and come to me, hear me so that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Um, I think this looks forward to uh, what we read later about Jesus in Revelation 1.5, he is the faithful witness. Um, and certainly he is the leader and commander of the peoples. Um, this is reflecting on the, the, the Davidic covenant, but it's speaking to uh, somebody who is coming after, right? 
the faithful love promised to David, the chesed, the grace promised to David, is going to come. Uh, and you, you read here, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. And it's going to be through this one who's going to be a witness, who's of the household of David. So this is a prophecy. This is a messianic prophecy. And so I would say here, we've talked about the term everlasting. Every divine human covenant that is called a covenant is called an everlasting covenant. But they don't all last forever, as I hope we remember. We've talked about this. The Noahic covenant's called an everlasting covenant, for instance. Genesis 9:16 is the first time the term is used, the phrase. But we're going to have a new heavens and earth. So there will come a day when the Noahic covenant's a dead letter, legally. Um, so it's not everlasting. But the word olam, translated everlasting, has the idea of it's so far in the past or so far in the future, it's out of sight. However, the covenant being implied here, talked about, the new covenant is going to be an everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, the blood of the everlasting covenant, that is an everlasting covenant because it never ends. The new covenant through, whom we, through which we have a new humanity, namely us, and a new heavens and earth, that is forever. That's, that's it. That's the last special grace covenant, and it is everlasting. And we can be glad it is. So that's, but that's the Davidic theme here connected with that in Isaiah 55. Jeremiah 23, um, prophesying um, this messianic figure too. Um, I will raise up to David, or for David, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely. Um, and uh, Jeremiah 30, they will serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. That is also characterized as a sprout from David's line. And so, and then David will never have, fail to have a man sit on the throne um, of the house of Israel. So how can, how can this one who is coming be called the branch, the sprout of David, the descendant of David, but also David? And we'll come to this because this issue shows up in Ezekiel also. Um, but the point is this, that the term David, the Hebrew term, the name David, is a passive form. And it comes from a root that means to love. And so the passive of the concept of love is beloved. And so when you, we read these things about, I'm gonna, they're gonna, David will be their shepherd, I'm going to raise up David for them. We're not talking about a resurrected David who's going to rule Israel. We're talking about the beloved who is going to be the, the branch, the sprout of David, and so on. So we'll come back to that, but that's what's going on there. And a similar sort of promise in Jeremiah uh, 33. Um, Ezekiel 34, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. Uh, Ezekiel 34, I the Lord will be their God, my servant David will be prince among them, I the Lord have spoken. Ezekiel 37, my servant David will be king over them, they'll have one shepherd. Um, and Ezekiel 37, David, my servant, will be their prince forever. <coughs> so the classic way of looking at these kind of statements has been, well, this is uh, kind of uh, Christological or symbolic messianic type, and that's true enough. But uh, as we've said, um, the real issue here is that the term David, Dawid, means the beloved. And so when you read these passages, the Lord is really saying a beloved one is going to be their prince. He's going to rule over them. And we learn later, of course, that that is Jesus. Um, there are certain geolog ge geological, genealogical notices or claims that are made here with regard to Jesus. Um, and... Uh, Matthew 1 starts out with this, the genealogy, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, Luke's uh, uh, introduction to, he will be great and we called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Um, and uh, in the genealogy that goes all the way back to Adam, uh, he's identified as the son of David and so on. Um, and uh, just, uh, just a mention here of Matthew's genealogy. 
um, there's a Hebrew sort of technique of using numbers. Uh, and when you do, uh, you find out that the genealogy, the three sets of 14 generations in Hebrew lettering, uh, can be characterized by the consonants that form the name David. And so the, the idea of David actually underlies the structure of the genealogy. Uh, it's called gamatria, and uh, you, that's something you can look, you find that online, I think, fairly easily. Uh, I've written about it in uh, my own third volume, but uh, it's not an idea new to me. But uh, it's just kind of fascinating that this, the David theme is very important. David is mentioned many, many more times in the Bible than even Moses, uh, which is interesting, and we'll look at it a bit later. Um, so, but anyway, the identification of um, this Davidic covenant and the importance of David here, Acts 13, Paul in his address to the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch tries to make the point that, listen, this is the one we've been waiting for. Paul identifies himself as one who's an apostle of the gospel, promised through his prophets regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. Well, this Davidic king was certainly expected, hoped for, um, and we see this in popular recognition too. Um, and again, we'll just kind of blitz through these because you'll have them in the notes. But uh, Jesus goes on here. Uh, he's, he has people, uh, two blind men following him, calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. Uh, people are astonished at his miracles and say, could this be the son of David? Um, The uh, Canaanite woman who hopes for deliverance for her daughter says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind men at Jericho here, uh, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, when Jesus is entering Jerusalem, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Of course, this offends the priests and teachers of the law. Uh, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, um, and so on. Jesus himself makes the argument, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Well, if David calls him Lord, then how can he be his son? Uh, Jesus here is taking advantage of the fact that Psalm 110 was understood to be a messianic psalm. But we know how that starts out. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand and I'll make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And Jesus is saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, if David is calling this messianic figure, this son of David, Lord already, how can he be David's son? Uh, so implying the mystery of the incarnation and what happened. Um, and so, they, of course, Jesus was fully aware of this. Um, if we consider the issue of typology... You remember when we talked about Noah, we talked about typology, and we said the typology, as scholars use the idea, is a matter of office, not necessarily of character. So uh, Ahab, even, as a king in Israel, who was not a very good character at all, still technically could be called a type of Christ because he was a king uh, in Israel. Um, and uh, that, so Noah then, as a covenant mediator prophet, who's actually worked for the redemption of people too, uh, certainly could be called a type of Christ. He also happened to have qualities that were true later of Jesus. He was righteous, you know, he was uh, um, uh, faithful to God and so on. Um, but David is a type of Christ by his offices. He is a king, he is a prophet, he was a shepherd. Um, just as an aside here, sort of, but... Uh, the idea of a, of a king as a shepherd is a very ancient one, the ancient world. Um, the pharaoh, if, if you read Egyptian inscriptions, pharaohs are not very often called shepherds. But if you look at the iconography, the pharaohs had a shepherd's crook. Um, the, in Mesopotamia, it was a very common uh, figure of speech. The king is a shepherd. Um, and so the idea that a ruler would be a shepherd is... Uh, as a standard thing. Why? Well, because you consider the mass of people out there, they're the flock, they need a shepherd. Uh, Moses, interestingly, was a shepherd before he was a ruler, a leader. Uh, David was a shepherd before he was a leader. 
And Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd in John 10. So that figure runs through the Bible. Uh, of course, with Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. We've talked a bit about this. The name David means the beloved. And so when Jesus comes out of the baptismal waters and a voice from the heavens says, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. If you translated that into Hebrew, you could say, this is my son, the David, because that's exactly what the name means. And so Jesus really is all that the name David could be or imply. And there you have the actual incarnation, the realization of the promise, uh, the promises that you get in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, especially about the, this David who's going to rule over them. We talked about the theme of witness. I just want to come back to that and tie it to something else here. Isaiah 55, we may recall, said, I'm going to, I've, making, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. And incidentally, I have made him. Okay? Well, how can you be using this? How can you say, I have made him, when it's going to be centuries yet before he's born? Uh, and that's just worth noting uh, here as a kind of a footnote or whatever. A lot of the prophecy in the Old Testament is spoken as though it's already happened. Um, and uh, S.R. Driver, a pretty liberal scholar uh, in Oxford in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, wrote a book on Hebrew tenses. And he had the idea, which I think is not far off the mark, um, that uh, of what he called the prophetic perfect. And what, the way he explained this was that for the prophet, uh, the idea was so vivid that it was for him a, an accomplished fact. So he wrote it as something that's already happened. I think a slightly better way of looking at that is this. If the prophets, as Peter says, were carried along by the Spirit, if the words they spoke were the Spirit speaking through them, well, the Spirit, God, is outside time. He's the Alpha and the Omega at one and the same moment. That's why Paul can say in Ephesians 2, we have already been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. For him, it's, well, that doesn't feel that way to us, but it's done. Paul is reassuring us. It's done. It's a done deal. Um, and so for God, before he created the universe, the eschaton was present to him, and it was passed to him. So for God, all being outside time, and of course, we live in a space-time continuum, right? Nothing can exist without time as part of the package the context in which it exists. And so God created time also. And if he created it, then it seems by definition he's outside it. And apparently heaven has its own time, and we won't get into that. But uh, although Meredith Klein has written about that, and I have too at the end of my first volume a bit, engaging him, but I think the evidence is there. But anyway, God being outside time, all things are present for him. All things are past for him. All things are future for him, all at the same time. And talk about his thoughts being above our thoughts. You know, we can't begin to get there. Uh, but the point is, if all times are past for God, he can very easily pr pr give through a prophet a description or a, an account of something as though it has already happened. There's nothing simpler. That's why in 1 Kings 13, I think, he can prophesy that a future king named Josiah will come here and do these things. That's why in Isaiah 44 and 45, he can, through Isaiah, prophesy Cyrus, who's not even born yet. So uh, that's not a hard concept, but one does have to acknowledge and agree that prophecy happens, that it's possible, that it is what it is. It comes from God. And if one accepts that, then you know, everything else follows. But so anyway, I have made him a witness to the peoples. <clears throat> in Psalm 89, we also read, I will appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of kings of the earth. This is the Davidic king who is coming. So these themes of Davidic witness and Davidic king, <coughs> or Davidic, the David is firstborn, converge in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, but also this same faithful witness is the firstborn over all creation. And it's important to understand this concept of the firstborn um, because the Arians, you know, 
had this idea that, well, look, if he's the firstborn over all creation, then he's really special because he was the firstborn, but that must mean there was a time when he was not. Um, it's misunderstanding the concept because in Psalm 89 we read, I will appoint him my firstborn. In other words, the firstborn here is being used as an, an appointive status, a technical, a legal concept. The firstborn is the heir. And the Lord is saying, this king who's coming, this David, I'm going to appoint him the firstborn. In other words, he's going to be the heir of all things, which is what he is. And of course, in him we too inherit. Okay, so this Davidic covenant entails the building of the temple. This temple is going to be built by David's son. His, David's son is Shlomo, Solomon. The name means his peace, which I just think is fantastic because the prince of peace, the Sar Shalom, the prince of peace in Isaiah 9 is this incarnate Davidic son who's coming. And Jesus makes the promise, peace I, live with, I leave with you. No, that's not what the world can give you. I leave it with you. And incidentally, uh, since we're talking about peace at the moment, it's not a bad thing to reflect on the meaning of that word because I don't think the Greek really captures it. But if we understand that behind this Greek term, Irene, is shalom, peace, the root idea of shalom is wholeness, soundness. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I'm going to leave tranquility with you. Because he's already said, you're blessed when people persecute you and lie about you because of me. Because that's what they did to the prophets. He's saying that by the spirit who dwells in you, I'm going to make you more whole, more sound. You're going to have shalom, soundness. Um, and that whatever else happens on the, from the outside, whatever comes your way. And that's, a much, that's much, much better. Uh, and that's what the promise is. And he's the prince of that. So, this Davidic son, he's going to be king, he's going to be prophet, he's going to be temple builder. And that, of course, is, that becomes us, the church. And there's a, a history of temple-related theophany that uh, is consistent with this. In the tabernacle, Moses completes the tabernacle. And then what happens? The glory cloud, the theophanic cloud, covers the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Later, when Solomon finishes constructing the temple, the son of David who builds that temple, while the priests withdrew, the cloud filled the temple. The priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple, just as the glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. Uh, and later the Lord characterizes this in this way, I have consecrated this temple, I've set it aside, I've declared it holy by putting my name there forever. So that's another thing, that temple that Solomon builds is, becomes holy. And it becomes holy not because people devote it to the Lord, but because the Lord consecrates it. He, his presence makes it holy. If we think back to Exodus 3, when the Lord showed up there and he told Moses to take off your sandals because this is holy ground, I think I can guarantee you, once that was all over and the Lord had left, the ground was just ground again. It was just dirt. There's nothing holy about it. You could have walked all over it with or without sandals. It wouldn't have mattered. So it's the presence of the Lord that makes the thing holy, and people have understood this for quite a while. Um, and so that's what makes us holy too. And we too become temples and we see the New Testament counterpart to this uh, Old Testament tabernacle in this investiture uh, by the Lord. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So this is, the, as scholars often recognize, this is a storm theophany. And uh, this is the Lord coming into the new temple, which he is now creating to be such, now making temples. That is all the people, the temple of living stones, as Peter puts it, the individual temples who together make up the corporate temple. 
So, um, which I just think shows a wonderful consistency in the Lord. You know, when a temple is prepared and he enters it and he makes it a real temple, a real dwelling. And we talked about the meaning of the word temple, meaning a big house or just basically a dwelling. That's how we can be called temples because a temple doesn't have to mean a building made of stone or whatever or even a tabernacle or a tent. Uh, it can be, it's wherever the Lord dwells uh, in a certain way, really present, and that's what he is in us. So this Davidic son we're talking about here, he is the beloved, he is the David. He brings his peace, and the name of Solomon foreshadows that or prefigures it. And he does build the temple, and so of course Solomon does that, but then the son of David, the greater son, the David, the beloved, builds the church. So a lot comes out of this Davidic covenant, these promises that we read in 2 Samuel 7. And uh, the New Testament, of course, certainly pulls this together for us. Well, <clears throat> since David is a prophet, it might be worth considering the dynamic of prophecy and what it can entail. Um, and so I'd like to look at David as a composer or a harpist or a worshiper. And uh, I think the first place that really shows up is in 1 Samuel 16, where you remember the Lord, the Lord tells David in um, 2 Samuel 7 that this son of yours who's going to build, the offspring who's going to build the temple, if he sins, I will chastise him, but I won't remove my love or my grace from him as I did with uh, Saul. Uh, well, this is what it looks like when the grace is removed. And I think this, so what is it? It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Well, but that's not the worst of it, because then an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And I think here, incidentally, we understand it's not that the Lord has a stable of evil spirits and he lets one go whenever he wants to do, give somebody trouble. He's letting an evil spirit come and do what it wants to do. And he's using that as a judgment on Saul in this case. Um, and so, and incidentally, later when David has committed that adultery with Bathsheba and in Psalm 51, he prays, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He knows what that looked like with Saul and he doesn't want that to happen to him. And so that's a very meaningful prayer on his part. And the Lord was faithful to that. He didn't take his spirit away from David, but he took his spirit away from Saul. And so Saul's attendants say to him, look, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. And one of them says, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well. He's a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. So Saul sends messengers to Jesse and says, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So uh, Jesse takes a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, a young goat, send them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, allow David to remain in my service for I'm pleased with him. Whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, that is the evil spirit that God let come on him, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better. The evil spirit would leave him. Possible explanations, psychological or emotional relief. Well, that could be. Uh, but uh, I, I would suggest that um, you could play some beautiful music uh, anywhere and it wouldn't necessarily drive a demon away, wouldn't drive an evil spirit away. Um, so what's going on here? I think, well clearly I use the term deliverance. Saul is being delivered of the spirit. The spirit's attacking him and he gets freed, he gets delivered of it for a time when David plays. Okay, so what is going on when David plays? Um, is he just playing a tune and it makes Saul feel better? I think there's got to be more than that going on. Um, Psalm 22, I think, may help us to understand this if we understand it in the right way. Um, the NIV translates verse 3, you are the one, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. 
Um, I think a better way of taking this would be, you are the Holy One enthroned inhabiting the praises of Israel. Um, and uh, if that's the case, what does that mean? Here's what I think. When real worship of the Lord is going on, the Lord responds, he honors that, he will presence himself. And that means then that his Holy Spirit is more present there and people are blessed. Some people can claim a palpable experience of this. Others don't feel anything, but I think it's going on at any time. And I think that's what this psalm means. The Lord inhabits the praises. When people are really praising him, he's there welcoming it, blessing them. Um, it's not just emotional. Um, so as I sometimes tell students, you know, I think you could have two people in two rooms. They're both singing the same hymns at the same time. One of them, they're really worshiping. They're singing, they're worshiping in spirit and in truth. The others, they're just singing the song. One of them, where their real worship is going on, the Lord is present, he's honoring it. The other one, not so much. I mean, he is omnipresent. I'm just saying he shows up in a special way. If that's the case here with David, that would mean, well, the Holy Spirit shows up. The evil spirit is not too comfortable with that. And so he departs for a while. That would explain it. Um, in any case, that is what happens. Uh, we later learn, I mean, talk about David and worship. David's very much involved with it, these passages, uh, as we uh, read about. Um, and the prophetic dimension is there. David certainly had a lot to do with the worship then later as king of Israel. Um, he arranged for the uh, certain Levites to be musicians and so on. The term harps, I kind of highlight it because it's involved. Um, and uh, interestingly here, uh, David sets apart some of the sons of Asaph and so on for the ministry of prophesying accompanied by harps, lyres, and cymbals. Um, and so that kind of connects the music making with prophecy. And prophecy happens, of course, because the Holy Spirit um, uh, is involved in it. Um, a passage that I think could be linked with this we find in 2 Kings 3. Again, I'm skipping over some of these because they're just along the same lines. But <clears throat> um, this is the, the case here is that Moab has rebelled against Israel, uh, was a vassal state of the northern kingdom. And, and uh, the king of Israel uh, and Jehoshaphat, who comes up from the south, the king of Judah, to help him, and the king of Edom, they come together as allies to go against Moab and try to reconquer them. Incidentally, this is very typical of what happened in the ancient world. A vassal would rebel, the suzerain would set out to reconquer them and bring them back under his suzerainty. That's exactly what's going on here. Well, they lose their way, and they begin to think that... Uh, that uh, you know, maybe the Lord has let them come out here to destroy them. He's going to judge them. And so uh, Jehoshaphat says, well, is there a prophet of the Lord around that we can consult? And they find Elisha. So Elisha comes and he says, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to you, the king of Israel. But now bring me a harpist. And so while the harpist is playing, the hand of the Lord comes on Elisha. And he says, this is what the Lord's, so that's interesting. What is the hand of the Lord? I think this is the term hand in Hebrew. I mean, if you think of it, it's not just simply this. And it's not the whole forearm, but it's like this. So it's the, you know, this is what you can do things with. You can wield a sword, you can make stuff. Sometimes it's used figuratively for power. Uh, and so I think that's a good understanding here. The power of the Lord came on him, but that we understand is the spirit. That's how, it's the spirit of prophecy. It's the Holy Spirit who produces the prophecy. So the yod, the hand, the power of the Lord is the spirit who comes on Elisha and he then prophesies. This is what the Lord says. I will fill this valley with pools of water. You will neither see wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water and you, your cattle and your other animals will drink. And uh, this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He'll also deliver Moab into your hands, and so on. And all this comes to pass. 
So what do we make of all of this? Well, what do we make of this in particular? Because the instrument and the playing that goes on is the same term in Hebrew that you get uh, when David is playing before Saul. And in this case, clearly, the playing, why does Elisha ask for that? I think for one thing, if the playing is, again, it's not just music, it's going to be worship. And the Lord responds to it and comes to him and gives him a prophecy. Now, the Lord doesn't have to have that happen to give a prophecy, right? The Lord can prophesy without having music going on. But he chooses to do it in this case. But here we have an association of the playing, the worshiping, if you will, and the Holy Spirit coming. I think that's probably what was going on when David delivered Saul as well. So, what conclusions or inferences can we draw here? Music could be an accompaniment of prophecy and worship. Uh, and uh, it, there, it, this seems to suggest that worship may invite the spirit for a work of prophecy sometimes. Now, we've talked about this a bit, but we might as well look at it here a little in the languages. <clears throat> Psalm 22. Uh, you, the holy, a holy one, dwelling or sitting enthroned, that verb can mean sit enthroned, or dwell, the praises of Israel. Um, the Septuagint takes that as you dwell among the, the holy ones, the praise of Israel. And the Vulgate, uh, similarly, you, however, in the holy place, you, you dwell, the praise of Israel. Um, probably the best translation is uh, you are the holy one, you dwell among the praises of Israel. You inhabit the praises of your people. So the tentative conclusions here, not all prophecy occurs in the context of worship, but a worship context may invoke the spirit of prophecy. That could be as relevant for the church today as it seems to have been for David when he delivered Saul. So the Davidic covenant anticipating the new, as we've said, and that's the covenant, the final, and the one remaining functioning special grace covenant to which we will next turn our attention. This is Dr. Jeffrey Niehaus in his teaching on biblical theology. This is session number eight, the Davidic Covenant.